This is Money Guide with Mary Stirk from Stirk Financial Services. Now, here's Mary Stirk. Welcome to Money Guide with Mary Stirk. And today we are going to be playing the game Who Wants to Be a 401k Millionaire? <laughs> Doesn't everybody? <laughs> Just kidding. We're not actually playing a game, but we are going to talk about how to become a 401k millionaire. And to do that with me, I have financial planner, Julie Chadwick. Hi, Mary. Thanks for having me. And Julie is one of our specialists in our office for working with people and their 401k plans, um, helping people understand how to invest money inside them, as well as what to do when you leave a job, what to do with that 401k. There's always many, many choices. And a lot of times we see people not knowing where to get started, how to keep it going, when to get out of it. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So here's the truth of it, is that for most Americans today, if you are working, your 401k is likely to be one of your largest sources of wealth that you save for retirement. And that's fantastic. These, As a retirement vehicle, these are great programs. Right. It's usually sometimes people say it is your company offers. It's an optional benefit. Really, it's not an optional benefit. It is an essential wealth being part of your retirement. Yes, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Now, one of the best tips that we can give to anybody listening is that you definitely want to start investing early. So even if you're young and you're in your early 20s and you really don't even understand what a 401k is, figuring this stuff out is your best plan. Now, it's never too late to start, right? but starting early is definitely your best strategy. Do you remember when you first started in a 401k plan? Yep. I remember having the job and they said, we have a 401k. I didn't know Not know what that was at all. Yep. And they simply said, you need to pick something here, and it's going to help you for retirement. And I almost laughed. I thought, retirement? (laughs) Heck, are you kidding me? It's so far away. Yeah, I have no idea. (laughs) But I got in it and just kind of went with the flow, but really didn't look into it and understand it at first. Yeah. And I remember when I first um, went to a benefits meeting, I was working for a company, um, and they offered this 401k and I started putting a little bit in it. And I remember when my balance got to be like a thousand dollars and I was looking at that with big saucer like wide (laughs) eyes saying, I have a thousand (laughs) dollars. How did that happen? (laughs) Right. Yep. So it was fun to see it, you know, grow and actually see that I was contributing to something. But you're never going to become a 401k millionaire if you don't actually start contributing to a 401k. So exactly. And (laughs) there you go. And take advantage of what the company offers, which is a match. That's a really, really, really important thing that a lot of times people will contribute, but they don't think that they contribute that much. Mm -hmm. And they might be missing out on some free money, which the company gives. Yeah. And I mean, I got to say free money is my favorite kind of money. (laughs) We love that. (laughs) That's the best. So in a 401k, you're putting money in. That's called your deferral, what you defer, meaning what you put into the 401k instead of taking as your salary. And that deferral, you generally are always 100% vested in, meaning you always own that. If you leave the company, you can take what you deferred. It's this match that you might not always be 100% vested in. And matches can be in all sorts of combinations. It could be a dollar-for-dollar match up to a certain percentage of your salary. It could be a combination of different percentages and things like that. But a lot of times the matches say, you know, you have to be here for five or seven years before you leave and can walk away with 100% of the match. Right. So you're always going to get your contributions, the part that you put in. But the defer or the company match, a lot of times you, you definitely want to meet what they're matching. Right. But you might not be able to take it all with you if, or if you did a job change or something like that. Right. And it's because the companies design these as a way to try to recruit, reward, and retain talent. Exactly. Yep. They want so, to keep their people there. Yep. Okay. So we've talked about getting started and participating. And like I said, it's never too late to start. So don't let your past mistakes of not starting early compound into mistakes of not starting at all. Anything is better than nothing. Exactly. Yep. Now, when you do get started, contributing the maximum amount that you can to your 401k is really essential because every dollar that you put into that 401k is basically investing in your own future. So 
you are able to contribute a strong amount of money to your 401k, even beyond the match. So what are the limits for 2019, Julie? Right. Most uh, people are familiar with like contributing to their own IRAs, and it's a smaller amount. It's like $6,000. But mm-hmm. when you're doing it within a plan, it's $19,000 that you can contribute for 2019. Yep. So that's a huge amount that you can contribute and put away, have growing tax deferred, and then get a match to that too. Yeah, so so it really can kind of grow. Now, if you're older than 50, there is a catch-up contribution that you can do an extra amount per year, getting up to closer to $24,000, $25,000 a year. But, you know, so you can kind of see how over time, if you're maxing this out, it really can start adding up. Right, and the numbers change a little bit based on some different factors, but that's the basis of it. Is you, you The key is you want to max it out if you can. Right. All right, so let's talk about that for a minute because I don't think that m- most people, certainly not everybody, can start out saying, oh, I'm just going to put $19,000 of right. my income into my 401k. <laughs> most people start out with putting enough in to get the full match from their company. Mm-hmm. So that is for sure step one. Another strategy, though, that you can do to drive towards becoming a 401k millionaire is increasing your contribution at regular times. Right. Almost setting it up systematically. And a lot of plans offer that where it'll automatically increase by a certain percentage each year. Yep. So when should you do that? You can trigger it off of several different things. But here's the top three times that you might think about increasing your 401k. The first is on your birthday. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday to me. I'm going to increase my 401k deferral by 1%. The second is the first of the year. January 1 is like a new year. People are usually making financial resolutions Mm -hmm. and things like that. So increase by 1%. And the third time is whenever you get a raise. Exactly. Yep. That's usually a key. Mm -hmm. So if you get a pay increase, increase your percentage by 1%. You will not miss it because it's money you never had in the first place. Right. And it's just setting up that and having that discipline in place to be able to either do it at certain times or set it up every year because then you're going to be more likely to keep that growing for you on a better pace. Yep. Now, the best savers, the people who drive to that 401k millionaire status, the fastest and the strongest, they increase their 401k contribution by at least half of whatever their pay raise was. Mm -hmm. So if you got a 4% raise, they throw two of it into the 401k and then let two of it come to enjoy life now. Right. Um, if you got a 10% raise, it's five and five, you know, so whatever your raise is, then if you can do half of that into your 401k, you're going to get there faster. You're going to meet that goal faster. Right. And it's sometimes hard when you're thinking about it, when you want to have that money in your pocket. But when you think about all the sooner years that you could be retiring, that's really kind of, you got to think of it that way. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Now, here's some things that I, you know, want to say about 401ks before we get into the actual investment piece inside of it. The 401k is often for people a set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's what I mean by that. First of all, most people don't really understand how to go about choosing investments inside there. So most people take a scattershot approach. They just like put a little bit into everything (laughs) or they pick a few things and put money into there or they pick one thing that they think looks good and then they never, ever look at it again. (laughs) They don't change it, look at the performance, see how it's doing. We see that all too often when we have clients come in the office and we're reviewing their 401k. So that's something that you really need to take a look at is looking at the performance, you know, the expenses in it. There's all kinds of things that you should be taking a look at. So how how often should you be looking at that? You should be looking at it at least once a year. There you go. You should be looking at it once a year. Just like anything else with your finances, you want to take a look, make sure everything's in check. What if, you know, the fund that you're in totally went kaput and, you know, the manager left and it's just not not a good fund to be in? Right. If you're stuck in that, you just kind of wiped out your growth for that year <laughs> or a couple of years if you never look at it. <laughs> there you go. Welcome back to Money Guide with Mary Stirk. And today we're talking about how to become a 401k millionaire. Now, 
One of the things that we think is very important to understand is how to best invest your 401k, which is a real gray area for most people who are involved in plans. Right. A lot of times we hear from people when they come in, they say, well, there's a person that comes around once a year at open enrollment time where they tell us what's available and they kind of go over a whole bunch of stuff. It's really confusing. I don't get it. And then they're gone. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then they have no idea. So then they just kind of pick something. (laughs) Most people listening to this can probably relate to that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that person that says, hey, you can always contact me, but then you never know how. <laughs> so the thing about 401ks is that most 401ks have a variety of options. Um, and many of the options are going to be separated by what's called an asset class. And an asset class is nothing more than just a segment of the market that's grouped together because it's kind of alike. So asset classes are broken down by size first, small, medium, and large. And then asset classes are broke down by something called style, which is growth, blend, and value. Now, the style is where people start to get confused because the size is a little bit easier to understand. Right. But the style is more about where the companies are that are invested in inside those funds, where they are in an economic cycle. If they're poised for growth, it's going to be more of a growth fund. If maybe they're undervalued and just trying to get back to a correct value, it's going to be more of the value side. And if it's a smorgasbord of the two, then it's probably a blend. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So if you take nothing away from listening to this, the main thing that you want to make sure you're doing is having your money spread out across more than one asset class. Right. It's going to give you better potential for better returns over time. Right. And because it's the whole theory of don't have all your eggs in one basket. Exactly. Right. Every one of those asset classes is the best performer once in a while. <laughs> and every one of them is the worst performer once in a while. So Right. So that person <laughs> that just kind of picks one and sets it and forgets it is going to have some bad years. So it's just right. kind of putting spreading that money out. So because there's such confusion, many plans have started adopting a couple of different things. They have either what's called a target date fund or they have something called a lifestyle fund. So Julie, share with us what a target date fund does for people. Is what a target date fund does or a lifestyle fund. Those are funds that all those different asset classes that we were talking about, within that one fund, it has a blend of all those different asset classes. So it gives you a grouping of all those. And as what it's going to do, it's based on your risk tolerance, but it's also going to get more conservative the closer you get to retirement. It's automatically going to shift down for you. So let's say that somebody thought they were going to retire around the year 2030. They might pick a fund that's called the target date 2030 fund. Exactly. So you align the date with the date you think you might want to retire. And then like Julie said, as you get closer and closer to that date, your fund is automatically going to adjust for you. Right. But within that fund, it's going to have all those different asset classes in there. So instead of you individually trying to pick them all out, Mm -hmm. whether it's a blend or the growth or whatever, and you don't know that, this fund takes care of that because it puts them all in there for you. Yeah. And I think that's huge because it kind of lets you um, pick one thing based on what you do know, which might be when you are likely to retire. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of does the rest for you. Right. Now, Be careful, though, because that doesn't come without a cost. Exactly. So when you look at the expense ratios of funds, target date funds tend to be more expensive internally with their management fees than just the other regular funds in your plan. Right. If you're picking them every single one, you're doing the picking yourself. Or in a target date fund or lifestyle fund, you have a a manager doing that for you. Right. Yeah. And that's why there's some additional cost. Yep. So It is certainly the easiest way, but it's not the least expensive way. And we definitely wanted to just draw some differentiation to that. Okay. Now, when it comes to 401k and becoming a 401k millionaire, another point of confusion that people have is, should I be investing in the traditional 401k side or should I be using the Roth 401k side? Right. So what's the main difference between the two? The main difference is on the traditional 401k, all your contributions are tax deferred. All right. It's it's, it's pre-tax money mm-hmm. that goes in, it stays tax deferred. And then when you take it out, then you pay taxes on it. Right. When there's a Roth option available, it's after tax money that goes in there. So you pay taxes when you make the contribution and then all the growth is growing tax deferred. And when you take it out, it's tax free. Again, tax free being my favorite kind of money. <laughs> I kind of like Let's free. Let's go for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's good to have a blend of them both. Yes, exactly. And and one thing people get confused about is even if you're putting 100% of your contribution into the Roth 401k, 
your employer is probably putting their match into the traditional side. Right. So when you come out with a pool of money at the end of your time with that company, you might have some that's pre-tax and some that's Roth. And here's the thing. When you go to roll them over, you can't roll them over to the same place. You have to roll the traditional side to a traditional IRA and the Roth 401k to a Roth IRA. Right. You have to keep them separated. (laughs) Yep. Because... You don't want to have to start paying taxes on money that doesn't have taxes due. Exactly. Yep. And a lot of people don't know that. A lot of times it's not clearly defined when you're looking at your statements, whether you have Roth money in there. So it's always a really good question to be sure to ask that when you're looking to do a rollover. Right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what to do when you have left a job. Because there's confusion for people about, should I just leave my money there? Can I leave my money there? You know, should I move it somewhere else? Can I just move it to my new job? And basically the truth of it is that every single person who leaves an employer and has a 401k has the same four basic options. Mm -hmm. You can leave it there. There's some rules surrounding that. You can roll it to your new employer if you have one. You can cash it out. We're going to talk about those rules of taxes surrounding that, or you can roll it to an IRA. Now, what which one of those is right for you is a personal decision. Right. It's not going to be one size fits all. It's going to be different for everybody. Right. And so let's break those down a little bit. So first of all, let's talk about the rules surrounding leaving it there. If you have a balance of less than $1,000, just letting you know they can kick you out. (laughs) Right. Usually they're going to say, hey, we're not going to manage this and keep an eye on it for you. Mm -hmm. It's too small of an amount. You need to take it out. Yes. So they usually don't give you an option. (laughs) Right. They'll they'll notify you. They'll give you a time frame. And then they'll send you a check. And and part of the reason why is because your employer pays a fee per participant in their plan. They really don't want to pay a fee for a participant who's no longer there with a low dollar value. Exactly. Yep. So that could happen. If you have a balance of more than a thousand, though, you generally have an option of staying in the plan. Now, there's some plans that are work a little bit differently, so that's why I'm saying generally. But you have the option of staying in the plan. Now, many 401k plans have administrative expenses that are passed along to the participants. And so if you're going to decide to leave your money in that plan, what you have to evaluate is what are the fees and costs associated with that and what are the investment options that you have available. If they're super great investment options and it's really, really low cost, it might make sense for you to leave your money in that plan. Exactly. Don't need to change it if it's doing well for you. Right. Yep. But doing well... Is something you have to look at. Exactly. Like, like we said, review it. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that covers leaving it in there. The next question that we get is, can I just roll it to my new employer's plan? Well, you might be able to. And the question really becomes, do you want to? Is that the best option for you? Yep. Right. Yeah. So again, back to the idea that many 401k plans pass along administrative expenses to their employees. A lot of people don't feel like they want to take money that's already theirs and roll it into a plan where they're subsidizing their new employer's plan. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you're kind of giving them some extra money to play with. So Right. And so here's the thing, too, is, is that with that in mind, again, does your new plan have all of the best investment options available, or are you going to be limited in choice there? And are their fees or expenses higher? Right. So those are things that you need to look at. Yeah. So those are kind of the evaluation points that you have to go through. The third option that people have is to cash it out. Now, depending on your age, this may or may not be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So if you're over the age of 59 and a half, then when you pull that money out on the traditional side, especially, you're going to have taxes due, but no IRS penalties. Right. And that's kind of the main thing that people look at. They're like, well, I'm 59 and a half, so I can go ahead and take it out. However, you're still going to pay taxes on that. And that could be a pretty big hit. Right. Especially if you take it all out in one lump sum. Exactly. (laughs) Now, there, if you take, if you have, if you're younger than that and you have taken it out, there is a 10% IRS penalty. Some plans, 401k plans are 10%. If you have a certain kind of plan called a simple IRA for your plan, it might be a 20% penalty if you haven't held the account for long enough. They have some quirky rules of their own. But there is a loophole. And I love loopholes. <laughs> those are almost, <laughs> clo- those rank right up there with the free money. Yes. The loophole in 401ks is that if you separate from service, if you're 55 or older, so between 55 and 59 and a half, 
and you take money directly out of the 401k, you would be able to avoid the 10% premature distribution penalty from the IRS. Right. Still would owe taxes, Mm -hmm. but you would avoid the penalty. Now, it only works if you take the money directly from the 401k. Right. If you roll it to an IRA first and then try to take it, you've closed your loophole. The rules change. Yeah. So if you're a person who is going to be retiring and you separate from service when you're 55 or older, but you're going to actually retire and need money before you're 59 and a half, we need to have a conversation about all the rules surrounding this loophole to make sure that you're following the rules so that you can capture the loophole benefits. And you can maximize the benefits. Yep, the, yep. Best, way to, the best way to move that. Now, the last one is to roll it to an IRA. And I do want to tell everybody out there that we think you should give us a call. You should talk to Julie about creating a 401k strategy for yourself. Should you roll it over or what you should do? She's the person in our office, like I said, that's a specialist. And rolling it to an IRA accomplishes a couple of different things. One is that it opens up the world of investment options. Right. You're no longer limited to what just the company offers in their pl- in their plan. Yes. And you that's have, huge. Yeah. You have the whole gamut out there. Plus, probably better management if you have so, you know an advisor like us looking it over and reviewing it for you. Right. Definitely more active management. And you also have access to a much wider array of investment vehicles. Mm-hmm. So 401k is going to have a set option for you. If you're rolling it to an IRA, there's all kinds of different options that you can go into. And then those are just custom tailored for you. Mm -hmm. So there's different expense levels. It might be more or less expensive than your 401k. So you have to evaluate that. But for sure, there's going to be a broader selection of options. And that's why rolling over these are so popular is because people have access to things they didn't have access to before. Right. And so with so many choices and options and decisions to make, that's why it's definitely good to come in and sit down with a planner. (laughs) (laughs) Most definitely. All right. So we've taken you through how to start in a 401k, what to do to maximize it understanding how to invest in it and what to do if you have one where you've left a job. We hope that that really has been helpful information for people on their own journey and is going to help you become your own 401k millionaire. Thanks for listening to Money Guide with Mary Stirk. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of your audio provider and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities or services mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should only be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Securities and investment advisory services are offered through Woodbury Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC. Insurance offered through Sterk Financial Services, which is not affiliated with Woodbury Financial. Sterk Financial Services is located at 350 Oak Tree Lane, Suite 150, Dakota Dune, South Dakota 57049, and can be reached at 605-217-3555.